Okay, why don't we have everybody sit down so we can start uh, panel five, our last panel of the day. Um, if any of the panelists want to come up and join me, we have a few here already, but uh, a few are missing, come on up. So, um, panel five, defining the future in chemistry of the indoor environment. And we start off with 10 minutes of my thoughts on the CIE symposium. So first, I want to thank AAAS and the Sloan Foundation for putting together this symposium on an important and fascinating topic. That's number one. Second, I want to thank individual people. Annette Olson, um, great symposium from AAAS. Uh, Paula Olowski from the Sloan Foundation. And pretty much all of our speakers today, as well as audience members, both online and in-house. Well, let me ask you a question, everybody. Have you learned anything today? Yes. Everybody said yes. Did the speakers clearly articulate the issues, the new information that they are learning from their studies, and the importance of studying and understanding the chemistry of indoor environments? Yes. So I say yes, so I'm glad you agree with me. We learned about microbes, we learned about people chemistry, we learned about surfaces, we learned about modeling, we learned about environmental factors, we learned about emissions, we learned about advanced instrumentation, we learned about the importance of indoor chemistry in our daily lives. We've learned a lot today. So the question now is, where do we go from here? Do we stop and say we have learned enough? It's too complicated, why bother? Or do we rise to the challenges and opportunities that the chemistry of indoor environments poses to us? All of us here are stakeholders. Industry, federal agencies, the healthcare enterprise, pretty much anyone who breathes the indoor air. We're all stakeholders here. When we think about putting funding into these types of issues, we know that uh, we are funding a lot of outdoor air chemistry. After today, you might want to think about, should we be putting 10 times, 100 times more into funding indoor air chemistry in our understanding? Or should we put it, be putting in 10 times or 100 times or more or less? Because that's the situation right now. We're putting in much less. So which way are we going to go? I think a very convincing case has been made today on the importance of the chemistry of the indoor environment. So many questions have arisen from these talks. These, these speakers have provided us with a lot of food for thought. And so what are our next steps? Those are the things that we want to talk about now. Do we have the, and, and some of the questions that have arisen, I'll, I'll sort of pose some of them and I'd want to hear some of our speakers and what some of their thoughts are. Um, do we have the research tools and the research infrastructure to address the research needs for understanding the chemistry of indoor environments, which range from fundamental studies to health impacts, and making sure that we're also including vulnerable and understudied populations? Should federal agencies come together in a coordinated fashion to provide resources for the various aspects of chemistry of the indoor environment, similar to what happened with the National Nanotechnology Initiative? Should we have a National Chemistry of the Indoor Environment Initiative? That's my question. How can collaboration between various stakeholders help gain an understanding of these problems, and importantly, some of the solutions? How do we define better materials moving forward? How do we want to think about this? How do we want to provide solutions? We've heard some examples of solutions. How do we continue on with this? Climate change and indoor air. Is there any uh, connections there? What is the role of climate change in the chemistry of indoor environments? Is there a role for citizen science in the chemistry of the indoor environment? Can we empower people? so that they know more about their indoor air, their indoor environments? And can we communicate the science of the chemistry of the indoor environment so that we can get people to uh, support what the community is doing so that we can help understand health effects, understand the fundamental chemistry behind some of these health effects? 
So those are some of the questions that have arisen for me, at least, when I was sitting there in the audience. And I want to hear from our uh, panel now on uh, seeing if anyone wants to address some of these, these issues about uh, research tools and infrastructure, uh, climate change and indoor environments, citizen science, anything that you would like to input on, I'd love to hear what you have to say, as, will, as does everybody in here and also online. Heather, uh, Heather, do you want to start? <laughs> well, is this on? Yes. Okay. Um, well, you know, thank you for kicking us off. Um, I mean, I, I, I sit here and you mentioned research needs and problems and ways to address, find solutions. And one thing I think about more based on my kind of bias interest in building materials and consumer products is the fact that and I was telling somebody this at the break, I spent a lot of time and money just trying to figure out what's in consumer products, mm -hmm. um, particularly the flame retardants in polyurethane foam. Yet out there, that information is available <laughs> within the industry, but they're not required to release that. They're allowed to keep that as confidential business information. And I, you know, I just find that just amazing that these chemicals can be used in large volumes. Some of them are probable carcinogens. And in the case of a flame retardant, it can be used in a baby's mattress. Um, at, you know, 5% by weight, leading to exposure to infants, um, and a parent has no way to learn whether that chemical is in there or not. And the only way to learn is to actually have someone analyze the material, because in my experience, half the time the manufacturers don't actually know because of the big steps in the supply chain from the person producing the raw materials to the finished product that's sold in the store. To me, that's a big problem that needs to be addressed. Um, and we know what the ingredients are in a lot of personal care products that are listed. We don't know what they are in the building materials, in our furniture, electronics, things like that, which are also sources of exposure. That's a big data gap that needs to be addressed, and that's you know, my, my two cents. Thank you. Important. Barb, did you want to say anything? <laughs> Is that my name? Is this on? No. Well, I guess I could address climate change. So, um, well, it, it seems quite clear that we're going to be likely to be using more air conditioning in the future. And so, if you're getting your air, if you're powering your air conditioning on um, fossil fuels, then that's a positive climate feedback. So, we gets hotter, we use more air conditioning, and then it gets even hotter. Um, but I, I do think we are going to need to think about, um, you know, how climate change is it, kind of both those feedbacks in both directions, how climate change is going to affect what we do in our indoor environment and how we control our indoor uh, uh, air quality, um, but also um, how do we uh, be responsible about how we manage the uh, indoor air quality and not exacerbate the climate change problem. And I guess that is going to play out differently in different regions. Um, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and the last oh, six or seven times I've been home, it's been really smoky um, from the big fires. And my mom will send me the, um, the public service announcement about what are you supposed to do to reduce your exposure to um, the fire emission to the smoke? And, and they do a pretty good job, I would say. Um, but some of those things are close your windows, turn on your air conditioner to get rid of the smoke, right? And where I live now in the southeast, it's really humid <laughs> in the summer. And I think um, my my friends, when I moved down there, have told me, no, you, you have to use your air conditioner or else your, your house will mold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's not unlikely it'll probably get even hum more humid in the southeast. So um, the problems are going to be different, the challenges across the country, and um, we're going to need to be thinking about how do we do this in a responsible way. Rich? Has anybody seen the news of what's happening in Houston today? Right, I think it's, uh, Dustin, I think you were the one that said it earlier, they're having their fifth 
fifth straight year of 100-year floods in Houston. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of hydrolysis reactions in buildings in Houston for the next several weeks, right, that have been just drenched. I was going to add something uh, about consumer products and, and chasing our tail a lot. Um, many of you are familiar with the fact that we've, uh, that there's been a great desire to go towards low VOC or no Z VOC latex paints indoors. Um, if you look at the VOCs that, that comprise, you know, modern latex paints, there's not a lot of evidence that any of them are really harmful to humans. The main concern about, low, about VOC emissions from paints is they get outdoors and, as Matt was talking about, they contribute to photochemical smog formation. They may smell and you may not like the smell, but, you know, no, no big health risks there. Now we've moved towards no VOC paints and we're replacing those VOCs with semi-vol organic compounds, some of which, some of which may be endocrine disrupting chemicals. So we, we've tried to solve one problem and it may have created another and that happens all the time. In, in our field, certainly in the indoor air field, uh, when we're dealing with consumer products of, of, of all, all sorts of different types of consumer products. Does anybody else want to add on? I guess maybe, maybe I'll add something that kind of tries to tie what they've said here, with what you've mentioned before, in terms of funding because of regulation. So I... I don't know, maybe it's my simplistic way of viewing it, but it seems that we, we like to say that a lot, that the outdoor air atmosphere chemistry has had a lot of research and a lot of research funding put into it over the past few decades because it's regulated. Um, but the indoor air, we can't regulate what people do in their own homes. They can, you know, they have the freedom to do whatever they want indoors, and, and we don't want to impose on that freedom, of course. But we're learning that what we do indoors affects what happens outside, uh, like what Matt's talk, um, re you know, relating our activities indoors with what comes outside, but then what Rich just said um, is also very important to be, to be noted. So we can't, we can't, um, we can't just regulate indoor activities or we can, we can use consumer products, we can use building materials, we can use uh, the industry to try to force change that will impact indoor air towards health, but we also need to be considering outdoor air pollution at the same time. We just can't do one thing without doing the other. So uh, making a change into a consumer product, like what happened with the case of the paints, just because of outdoor air pollution is, is just not sufficient. Indoor exposures are very important, indoor health is very important, um, and it's not completely outside of our control. Sometimes I feel like I hear uh, that we, we are powerless to, to um, the expo we are powerless to change or to impact people's exposure to indoor pollutants because we can't control what people do in their, in their own homes. But that's not true. We can educate and we can interact with industry to make those changes happen from upstream in the chain, in the supply chain. Laura. All right, is this on? Yes. I think yes? it is. Okay, so I've got two things. One is, we do need more indoor chemistry research, that is clear. And I need to know what this means. What are the implications for public health so I can translate it into EPA guidance? I just thought I'd reiterate it. And I'd also like to point out that, yes, that there is definitely a link between climate change and indoor air quality. In point of fact, the study director, David Butler, for the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine study on IAQ climate change as health is sitting in the back of the room today. The report is available online for free. Check it out if you haven't seen it. It has one of the best covers ever for a report. Uh, and thank you. Cora Manabu. You, you, you go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the gaps in terms of measurements. So I think one of the things we've seen today is that a lot of measurements are needed. And that it's not always straightforward to just take the techniques we use outdoors and bring them indoors. Certainly we can, we can test certain environments where the occupants are amenable, um, but that really is limited. So, uh, you know, bringing in a giant instrument is, is great sometimes, but you can't survey a, lot, a large number of homes that way. 
uh, or large number of indoor environments that way. And um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, and sometimes the biases are different indoors, um, like with, with the Hono. Um, so it would, be, it would be great to have some techniques developed specifically for indoor surveys. Yeah, so you made a point, more measurements are necessary, I agree. And I, I, I think I should say that more monitoring activity is also necessary. <laughs> and um, so if you compare with outdoors, there's weather forecast monitoring and there's chemical transport model that can predict ozone concentration, PM2.5. So unfortunately, not um, in indoor uh, communities, there's not a such uh, established uh, predict predictive model yet, I, 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 as far as I know. And uh, so we want to work towards to that direction that to achieve sort of a model that can be used to predict indoor air quality. It's a long way to go, but that's, that's something that um, um, would, be, would be great and then that's, that's beneficial for society. So any um, additional questions from the audience, both uh, here as well as online, it's definitely welcome. They're welcomed as well. Please go to the mic. I want to just tag on to what Manabu just said because I think it's actually really important as a measurement person. Um, it's hard to say this, but we actually really, 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 really need the models. And the reason I say that is because outdoors we have one big airshed. And, and things are relatively well mixed. You, you measure in a city and you get a pretty good idea of the whole city. We've talked today about carpet, different materials, chairs, what mattress, like all of these things can change indoor environment to indoor environment to indoor environment. And there's no way we can make measurements in every combination out there, but we can model it. So we need to do the measurements we can to inform the models and then take those models and say, what does this indoor space look like? And use what we've learned in the few measurement places that we've done to really inform the indoor spaces because the heterogeneity across indoor spaces is huge right. compared to the outdoors. I totally agree. So I want to say thank you for that comment. It kind of gets to where I was going to go a little bit, which is we have a lot of information. Some of it's concerning, some of it's less concerning. We um, know that people spend most of their time indoors and when do we say we have enough to start making some decisions? And I would argue or suggest that maybe we have enough to start making some decisions or recommendations now as we continue to measure and model going forward. Yeah. Anybody want to comment? Well, I would say there, there, you know, when we talk about chemistry and chemical reaction products, so many of them that are being identified, we, we don't have any talks data for at all. And so, so a question is, um, you know, do we use a precautionary principle and say, well, prob the stuff's probably not good for you. You know, it may not be really bad for you, but there are ways of actually quenching chemistry. We can, we can make decisions that we don't want to see those reaction products, mm -hmm. so let's just stop them from forming now. And there are ways to engineer that. And it's, in, in for certain types of chemistry, that's actually pretty easy. For other types, it's not, but um, but that's one of the things that I think Glenn's worked on and, and I've worked on is is how do we just quench especially oxidation, especially ozone chemistry in indoor environments? That's actually not that difficult if we want to do it. So I'm going to go to a couple of questions from people watching uh, online. Uh, w T asks, is green chemistry the answer as far as building materials and consumer products are concerned? And how does the panel think we can move faster in that direction? Cora? <laughs> Before Cora answers the question, I just want to Nina? ask if, um, if maybe you can or anybody can actually define green chemistry, I think that's really important. Uh, because there's the, there's the traditional view of green chemistry that's known, there are uh, the, the 12 principles of green chemistry and all of that. But there's also, there are other sides of it that, that um, some researchers consider to be green. I've seen the use of you know, tea extracts to reduce environmental impacts for green chemistry. So I just wanna, be very clear on the definition of green chemistry. Um, and in our case, it, it may re relate to 
the production of the, of the materials that are used for air treatment or the actual products of the materials and the environmental impacts of these materials throughout the entire life cycle. So we have Mary Kirchhoff from the American Chemical Society here who wants to speak Hi. to that. Oh. Hi, I'm director of the Green Chemistry Institute at ACS. So the Perfect. commonly used definition for green chemistry is the design of chemical products and processes that reduce or eliminate the use and generation of hazardous substances. So that's what's been used for quite a while. Now, I will say that definition has evolved, and it's including, it's, it's much broader now and includes things like LCA and systems thinking so that we're looking at it holistically and not simply focusing on toxics use reduction. Does that help? Yes. yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you want to add anything, Cora? Not to the definition. <laughs> <laughs> so given what um, Heather said earlier, that we don't even know what's in building materials, how can we move faster um, to sort of a green chemistry approach? Anybody want to comment? Makes it difficult. Uh, yeah, yeah I, think, I think Heather pointed out something important that we don't even know what's in, in these products. One more online, and then I'll go back to the in-house audience. Uh, Monica Rokiki um, asks, what do you think the role of home air monitors might be in, increase, in creating a citizen science force and also to mobilize awareness and action? Does anyone want to take that question? Well, I'm all for it. Um, so during, during home chem, we, uh, Rich and I actually collaborated by installing a number of uh, low-cost monitors throughout the house, well, in the kitchen and in the living room, and we're working on analyzing those data now just to see how reliable those are. And the data that's, that's, that we're digging through and then information that exists already online, uh, there's a really good paper by Brett Singer's group at LBNL, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. There's also uh, some resources from a website called AQSpec, uh, by the South Coast Air Quality Management uh, District. They have evaluated a number of these low-cost air, air quality monitors. Um, the consensus out there so far is that these obviously do not and probably never will work as well as research-grade laboratory instruments. So it's, it's, it's important to realize that and to recognize and take all the data that you see with a grain of salt. Um, you might be seeing a spike that is overcounting or undercounting what the reality is for, for what you're seeing. But most of these instruments, you know, uh, at least in the case of cooking indoors, for example, it'll help a consumer tell, oh, there's something going on, Particul particulate matter levels went up. Um, the same may or not, may not be true for other measurements like CO2 and VOCs, but let's stick to particles for now. These instruments can be very, very useful in educating the community to understand when they're exposed to particulate matter levels that could be harmful to them. And then that might trigger them to, you know, exhaust, uh, ventilate, try to reduce their exposures. So I think there is a really good place for them in educating uh, the overall consumers. Thank you. We have a question here. Chris Avery, ICF International. Um, I, this is sort of a leading question, but just a very brief one. A lot of people here have talked about how important interdisciplinary work is to this type of a field. Thrilled to hear that, super excited to hear that. How many of you, or, or have any of you, considered or, or already brought in policy researchers to that discussion? There's a lot of fundamental, that's very exciting to hear, and I would love to talk to you offline more about that, because there's a lot of research that can be done in that space as well, alongside the fundamental research, that can hopefully build better outcomes in the far end. So those who haven't done it, I would encourage it, but I'm thrilled to hear that some people are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. Do um, you want to comment, Hugo? And then we have. Yeah, if I, if I may brief, briefly answer from our point of view, I think I mentioned <clears throat> on our presentation about uh, how our consortium integrated policy as part of the, the whole uh, uh, research program. And that includes the research element in terms of policy, which is understanding what are the needs. This is a, a, a relatively smaller problem in that it only addresses uh, tobacco smoke, but it's still, I think it's a good model for a larger uh, initiative on indoor chemistry as a whole, which is understanding what would be the more immediate policy needs and as you mentioned, and I agree with that, including your team, people that could be 
uh, you know, working on that. Uh, I think that's a very good uh, suggestion. Thank you. And you wanted to say one thing? Yeah, I was just going to mention for the last point about working with policy, those in the policy arena is not policy, but I think it's really important that we in the indoor community work with psychologists and human behavioralists because so much of what happens in the indoor environment is driven by what people do in the indoor environment and trying to understand why some people, you know, don't use the exhaust vent on their stove when they cook or why some people like to burn a lot of incense or why some people like to vacuum, you know, ten times a week as opposed to once a month kind of thing. It's, it's really important and those things all affect what people are exposed to indoors. It goes back to the human psyche and there's probably no, are there any human behavioralists in this room at all? You know, if you go to major indoor air quality conferences and you ask that to a thousand people, how many of you worked with a psychologist or are a human behavioralist, nobody raises their hand. And I think that's a big missing link in, in, in our community. So just wanted to make that point. That's my soapbox, so. Mary, you have a question? Yes, please. Um, two questions. So in the last year and a half, we've been using a declaration that manufacturers can now use, the um, healthy product declaration within the building industry. This is where manufacturers can go and share their basically their substance list, right, of the material makeup of their products. and. We try to do exactly what you've suggested, which I appreciate, is using and applying the precautionary approach where an, a known or suspected harm um, is in question, then we look for an alternate and present that within the design case. And I'm kind of wondering, um, we use that, we look at these lists of substances, and then we take our precautionary list, which is class-based, and we're looking at the most harmful substances that are out there. Um, that we know show up over and over again in the materials, formaldehydes, bisphenols, um, PFCs, right, et cetera. Um, and those are things that designers, we can educate them on and they can start to see where those are showing up. How do, I, I'm interested in your perspective, if you would agree with the class-based with, approach with so many substances that are out and, or, and, and chemical compounds that are continually coming out, right? that um, the way that we're trying to work on this from one side of the spectrum is let's take care of the ones that show up the most and are the, the um, real harmful offenders. Um, so that's my first question. And the second one is in regards to green chemistry, I'm wondering if there is an ability to start looking at bringing that into the market where we don't have alternates. There are, mater there are materials where I don't have a solvent, I don't have an adhesive or a sealant, right, that is going to do the trick that would remove those big substances of concern. And I need someone to start working on those, those solutions that involve green chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to um, kind of hear your perspective and if you think that that might be a way to go about it. Thank you. Anybody want to comment? Heather? I'll certainly address the first part. Um, you asked whether we ag agree with the class-based approach, and this is certainly applied to the flame retardants recently with the CPSC report. Uh, I certainly agree with that. I think we need to find something. It's just, it's just, uh, it's unsustainable to, to evaluate things one at a time as right. we learn all these different things. Although I would like to point out, and again, this is probably my personal bias, is that I think we really need to start looking more at mixtures, right? Because I mean, I showed that plot. I know it was really quickly, but there was like. 30,000 different chemicals in indoor dust, and we only know like 280 of them. I, it's just so important for us to start evaluating toxicity and pathways when you're exposed to all of these in combination. Um, I understand we regulate one chemical at a time, but if our end goal is to understand human health effects, we need to think about these uh, in terms of mixtures, which is really important. Um, I'll let someone else address the green Can chemistry. Can I follow up? Yes. Because I think this is a really interesting point that do we really need to know the toxicity of the 30,000 compounds, right? Because in outdoor air community, um, ozone and PM2.5, and the PM2.5 consists of different kinds of, of compounds, but epidemiologists use only PM2.5 mass as a measure of health effects, right? So there's a discussion there, but um, I wonder that do we really need to, all of them, maybe it's impossible anyway, so maybe is it, are there any other uh, metric that we can measure, for example, total SVOC loading or oxidant concentration? Should we think in that way to address such question? That's an open question. Good, good question, yeah, because it's hard to measure the toxicity of individual compounds, the mixtures of the compounds, 
in a way, uh, in a timely fashion, we'll say. Um, but if we just consider total, total numbers is a way to reduce the problem. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment? Maybe on green chemistry, some of the additional green chemistry thoughts, and if that could be a solution for where we don't have alternates right now. What do you think? The role of green chemistry. <laughs> I'm seeing nodding, but that one might stay on the table. I'll acknowledge it's important. I just think it's, um, I mean, I'm not in that field, but I would just say my knowledge just feels like there's hard to get funding to do that and to, to apply it and to understand how well they work. You know, there's certainly natural products that are toxic too, right? So you always have to be evalu to evaluate mm -hmm. that as well. So. Yeah. Okay, we have, uh, um, let's see, I think you're next on this side. Just a real brief one. Um, you'd mentioned the challenge of collecting data in homes, and uh, I was wondering if you'd seen any developments or any opportunities with the rise of the Internet of Things, for instance, in objects, um, collecting data on, you know, when people are inside the house and regulating indoor temperature and that sort of thing, um, if there's any sort of corollary in this sort of field. Thanks. Making more measurements in the home. I think maybe we're talking about sensors, right, in a sense. And um, so we all spend a lot of time indoors, and yet we're all, not all in the same house, except for that one where there was a party in some faculty <laughs> house. But, Alan's house. Um, you know, so there's both, there's this combination of needs of um, measuring in lots of homes so that we can get a a population, an idea of what's going on in a population basis, and then um, and then doing some much more detailed uh, experiments in a very small subset of homes, probably. But I think it, there's clearly a need for more um, low-cost sensors to measure important things that we can, you know, where we can put these in lots of lots of locations and get a better sense of the distribution. Yeah, I'm Bernie Atkin in the uh, Toxicology and Environmental Exposure Scientist at NIH National Library of Medicine. We do have one. Yes. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's great, great conversation, great, great meeting. I did want to note that you've, we've, I've heard loud and clear the need for information about product compositions. And yeah. I wanted to note that we do have the household products database available for, we've had it available for like nine, last 19 or so years. Mm -hmm. And we've added categories over the years to it. I, I, we don't have things like wallboard or some carpets, but we do have caulk, caulking, paints, and other things. But I, I'll, I'll take that back as a good idea yeah. to add as other categories. Our contractor does a great job going after companies to get the information, so we can see what he does. I did have an actual rapid-fire question for everybody there. What's your key journal and key database? Just going around the mm. table. I'm just, I'm curious. I, I'm assuming you all use PubMed. <laughs> I saw a lot of references to indoor air and uh, environmental science and technology. Any others? So, I use Web of Science, environmental sciences, and uh, and technology. And environmental health perspectives was another journal. Anyone else has something to add? Environment International is one I. Use. Environment International. What about databases? You asked about. Yeah, just just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I use the chemistry dashboard a lot, but that's a that's an entryway into lots of different databases that are there in one. I wanted to make a comment related to the earlier question about uh, how do we use all the really detailed chemical information that we're collecting because one could think about it just in terms of the application to public health and worrying about toxicity. As a chemist, I'm really thinking about that complexity as uh, a set of clues. I'm a detective. I'm trying to figure out where does all this organic material come from. Looking at the total doesn't necessarily tell me that. But also, looking at the total doesn't tell me how much of it was directly emitted, how much of it was actually produced through chemical processes indoors. And so, we really do have to dive into the complexity of the chemistry to understand the processes that are controlling what we're exposed to indoors. 
it, I don't think it means that we're uh, likely to be able to test toxicity of every chemical, um, but there are chemical classes we know we're more worried about. However, even when we try to speciate all the organics that we see indoors, uh, as, as you mentioned, it, it was only you know, five or 10 percent that at best that you're speciating. And so we're, we're using five or 10 percent identifications to uh, try to get clues about what the other 90, 95 percent uh, 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 came from, how it was chemically transformed, and how it might affect our health. So I would argue we really have to keep digging at the chemical complexity, and that's an area where we're, as a field, um, I think making a big impact at the moment with all these people who have done a little bit more uh, work on uh, outdoor chemistry, uh, detailed uh, chemical composition measurements with new mass spec tools. I think this is an area we're actually making progress, but what isn't happening well enough is communication with the tox uh, uh, toxicology community, the, the health sciences community, to figure out where the sweet spots are. You know, where do we really um, have an opportunity to make progress in working together? So I hope that that kind of effort is something that come out, can come out of all of our discussion here and, and can lead to some of the things like, like how do you make better glues or how do you make better paints? Uh, but I think it's at the intersection of these communities where we're likely to make progress. Thank you. We have two more questions and I think that will be it. Um, having started here early this morning and listened to a great number of very interesting and informative discussions, uh, I wonder if anyone can recommend a, an effective face mask that I can wear outdoors uh, and when I go home where uh, all the time I'm indoors in order to protect me from all the hazards I've heard about. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> I'll just make the comment that, that personal protection is considered to be the least effective form of air quality control. I, I actually wanted to re refer to this. I mean, my, my impression of, of the uh, presentations today is that there's a lot of great work going on identifying what's in a building and what influences it, and to some extent materials related things. Um, if I was looking at this from the point of designing uh, a heating and cooling system for a building, we're still talking just about the loads. You know, after that, the question is how do you put the building together to, to meet them? We only really talked about solutions from the point of view of, well, get rid of materials that are bad, uh, get rid of processes that are bad, and, and maybe make some uh, material uh, additions to the building that might remove some contaminants. No, uh, no discussion about the, uh, the mechanical systems that are there specifically for the purpose of controlling those things. And so mm -hmm. I, I wanted to, to go to um, the issue of, of indoor air quality standards. ASHRAE standard 62.1 for non-residential buildings is the main standard that goes into codes. How does it dis define acceptable indoor air quality? Air in which there are no known uh, hazardous materials at harmful concentrations as uh, identified by cognizant authorities and with which a substantial proportion of the occupants do not express dissatisfaction. So one of the tasks is simply to, to determine what the harmful levels of things are because if we know what they are, we can control them. Um, Beyond that, I think what we're lacking is a holistic approach, and I hate that word, but I haven't got time to think of a better one, for designing buildings. If I want to design from an energy point of view, I can pull out mm -hmm. ASHRAE standard 90.1 that deals with, with the envelope, with lighting, with surface water heating, with the mechanical systems. The whole schmear is an integrated system. We could have a standard like that for, for indoor environmental quality if we made it a goal to have one. And I think that's a, a role for scientists is to help participate in that project. The reason that ASHRAE formed an environmental health committee and started having an IAQ conference was specifically to get scientists who are outside the, the building industry to advise it on what we needed to do to improve indoor air quality in buildings. And that, that question is still there to be answered in a lot of ways. Uh, and one more thing is uh, to the other comment here, we do identify more and more things in their toxicity, but think about the job that an architect or a mechanical system designer has. What they want to know 
is the smallest possible list of things that they actually have to measure and control. So, you know, I think if we can harmonize those needs with what science has to provide, then we'll really get somewhere. Thank you for your comment. And did you want one more? I wanted to close this. Oh, go ahead. Close. Oh, and we can talk later. Or did you want? Do you have a very important comment? Shall I? Yes. Okay. I was going to comment that I think we're going to continue to learn for decades. You know, the Clean Air Act is almost 50 years old, right? And in the last 50 years since we promulgated the first reactions and we threw some pollutants out there and said we know these are bad, there's been 50 years worth of research since the original Clean Air Act. And we've had Clean Air Act amendments and we keep tweaking it and get it better and better and better. But there's five decades of research that allowed us to get better and better and better in our knowledge of what outdoor pollutants do to us, right? And I think the same is going to be true for the indoor airfield, indoor chemistry, is that, you know, there are some things we know are bad right now, right? We already know radon and lead are bad. We're going to learn more about chemistry and chemical reaction products, but we'll be continuing to learn for decades about this. And as we move forward, I, my hope is that we'll continue to learn and continue to get better and continue to learn about more compounds that we should be controlling. But it doesn't happen overnight. It hasn't happened overnight in the outdoor atmosphere, right? It's taken 50 years to get where we are today. So thank you for that comment. You know, our last two questions pointed towards understanding the detailed chemistry to designing the building. Um, I would say we have a lot of work to do. We have many scales to work at, and uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for participating uh, in this, uh, this meeting, and especially the uh, panel here uh, during uh, the fifth and final panel. Thank you.